Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we are picking up with Deceased, DC's Zombies event. And in reality, I feel like it was only ever a matter of time before we saw that. I mean, to a degree, we got Blackest Night, but Blackest Night was more of a Green Lantern event than it was. I mean, it did involve all of DC, but that was more of like, we're not doing this for the sake of doing zombies. We're doing this because we want to bring some characters back and other characters we want to leave dead, right? Like Blackest Night brought back pretty much everybody who died. And then like Brightest Day basically kept the ones they wanted. But this is just a straight up like zombies event. Like, that's really all this is. It's just like a straight up DC zombie story. And it starts in one of the coolest ways ever. What this does is it initially picks up with Darkseid. Now, we get this kind of like, kind of narrative that goes through there. Like, you know, my mother always used to say there were there was never any such thing as monsters and so on. But it's interesting because Tom Taylor's the one writing this. And here's the thing about Tom Taylor. Tom Taylor is really, really good at writing stories that are basically something akin to like post-apocalyptic or if like things are going crazy, right? Like when it comes to something like this, this is where Tom Taylor really, really, really shines. And this is kind of cool because it initially picks up with like dark side invading earth right like and you've got a you got some cool characters here that you wouldn't normally see like you've got black lightning who's here and then you have your standard fare of the justice league now remember this is like a whole different universe in dc this is not an incontinuity story as far as i'm aware it's some it's basically like a what if story for marvel so because of that some of the characters do look a little bit different but you basically have dark side showing up here and like the justice league defeats him right which is what you would expect right i mean usually whenever dark side shows up it's kind of like the justice league fights him for a little bit then they defeat him and then that's basically the end of that what's kind of ironic about this and this is kind of a funny thing what's kind of ironic about this is remember in the dc multiverse there's only one dark side and he's currently in justice league odyssey so this is one of those scenarios where you just kind of have to just go with it and just say what the heck ever you know what i mean like if you're a huge continuity stickler well then i don't know what to tell you but it is kind of cool because when they of course wonder woman gets the lasso of truth around dark side and the way this works is that those individuals who are bound by the lasso are usually like they're forced to answer whatever question uh wonder woman asks truthfully right and they're usually weak or not really weak but they're usually like helpless within the the confines of the lasso with dark side the, the statement is like you will not return to our world say it the lasso compels you to and dark side says yes i'm not going to come back for your world and then he just removes the lasso so, and it's like, because I have what I came for. Literally, Darkseid overpowers the lasso of truth, which is cool. But from there, we end up finding out that, like, no one can find Cyborg. Cyborg was in Metropolis at one point along the line. He was basically helping to, like, deal with all the parademons and all that kind of stuff that came with, like, Darkseid's invasion. But nobody knows where Cyborg is anymore. And that's presumably what Darkseid came for. Now, one of the cool little things that go on here, this is kind of important, is a little bit of character building. This is one of the reasons why I say that, that Tom Taylor is really good at this. Tom Taylor is very good at capturing the nature of characters, and no matter what story they're in making sure they stay true right like batman's the guy who doesn't trust anyone and so it's almost tower of babel-esque in the sense that like batman pulls up his device and says like like cyborg's nowhere around here and they're like well how do you know that and it's like because i put a tracking device on him because the guy's got apocalyptic technologies basically like a walking mother box he's essentially like a crazy weapon it'd be stupid to leave him here and there's a, a bit of distrust that comes from the rest of the justice league like really man you're still doing this after all this time but it makes sense it's the nature of batman's character now from here we switch over to apocalypse proper now remember apocalypse is a is a is a world of pain and suffering it's really all it is it's the equivalent of hell in the realm of dc right like you've got high father on new genesis which is supposed to be equivalent to heaven but high father's kind of a dick and then you have apocalypse which is supposed to be something akin to hell they're not it's not actually heaven and hell those do exist in in dc and the vertigo line but in terms of the main dc superheroes which you never really see the the concept of like vertigo with like the presence and then lucifer morningstar and those characters because you never see them cross over with uh, the main dc superheroes they're largely considered to be kind of isolated and on their own even though they're really not and so because of that apocalypse and, and new genesis is about as close as you get to heaven and hell but because this is a place of suffering and torment it's literally cyborg being hooked up to a torture machine and then basically being asked questions and this is where the revelation comes from that what dark side had been pursuing was the same thing he'd always been pursuing which is the anti-life equation now again tom taylor really like kind of knocking it out of the park here it's designed to read to, to bring in new readers people who have never really read dc and specifically have never really read anything about the new god won't know what the anti-life equation is. The anti-life equation is a mathematical proof that if you can basically find it and, and if you can use it, you can dominate the will of all sentient beings in the universe. It's what Darkseid's always been hunting for. It's what he found during the events of Final Crisis. Like, it's it's a it's a major part of the, the DC landscape. Now, but where Darkseid has had one half of the equation, which is to say, if we were to use slope, the equation Y equals MX plus B, then what Darkseid basically has is MX plus B. He doesn't have Y. And so what he's doing is looking for the other half of the equation. He 
he's looking for Y, and it seems to have manifested itself inside of Cyborg. Now, the nature of the anti-life equation is kind of strange, right? Like, the equation is, is it's literally, it's, it is a mathematical proof, but it can also, it's also sort of a biological concept. If you solve it and use it, it has a tangible effect, and it'll spread like a virus, and that's exactly what happens. Darkseid basically takes the anti-life equation, and then he in turn summons death, and then in doing so, summoning the Black Racer, he basically takes a portion, he takes the anti-life equation and merges it with an aspect of death. Essentially, like, I guess maybe this twisted perception that the anti-life equation can be used to kill everyone. But because of that, because the anti-life equation has been merged with death, it basically corrupts the equation. And when it does, it sends Darkseid spiraling out, right? Like, he just basically loses his mind and succumbs to absolute and pure madness. And, like, the, the literally the Black Racer is, like, time for God to die. And Desaad, because of the fact that he's basically immune to any kind of, of viruses or anything like that, any kind of disease, he's not infected by, by basically this corrupted anti-life equation. But in realizing what it's doing to Darkseid, sends Cyborg away in hopes that it'll basically fix Darkseid. Now, of course, this sends Cyborg back to Earth, but at the same time, Darkseid loses his mind and then destroys the entirety of Apocalypse and wipes all of it out. And so when Cyborg lands back on Earth, he brings the corrupted anti-life equation with him. And that's how the zombie infection spreads. It's actually a genius idea. A virus that's designed to bend others to its will and then in turn merge it with death, basically bends others to its will and turns them into the walking dead. It is super cool. And it's, it's a, it really, really works. But kind of drawing from Final Crisis, because of the fact that the anti-life equation is a mathematical proof, and because of the fact that Cyborg is a walking, talking, cybernetic organism that basically taps into the internet, the anti-life equation, the corrupted equation, basically leaves him and goes into the internet. It turns into Skynet and literally spreads everywhere. It goes all over the place. So every single form of social media to everybody's phones spreads like wildfire. So it's very similar to what you saw in spreading the anti-life equation in Final Crisis, which again, makes sense. But because of the fact that the world is so plugged into social media, those looking at Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, the whole nine yards are all basically blasted with this virus and in turn are basically hit with like the corrupted version of the anti-life equation. And in doing so, like they all basically succumb to like these zombie monster things. But basically, Cyborg is the one that starts off the, the that sets off the whole zombie apocalypse. But it's kind of interesting here because in turn, like you have Superman talking to Scott Free, talking to Big Barda, of course, you know, Mr. Miracle, and basically saying, hey, look guys, like, you know, we got to find Cyborg, so on and so forth. But in the middle of all that, he basically takes off because all he hears is screaming only to realize like it's this whole virus thing is spread across the world now superman doesn't initially know why all this is happening and it's it's, it's one of these things that tom taylor kind of passes over right like that's that's one of the downsides to tom taylor tom taylor can like hop, skip, and jump from point to point to point and not fill in the gaps and then kind of leave you asking questions of, well, but like how though? And like what seems to have happened is between the time like Superman went out there and the world was screaming and the time that we pick up with Jonathan, Lois, and Damian Wayne, that basically Superman figured out that this virus is being spread digitally. Now, we can kind of make some assumptions here. So maybe like in this universe, Final Crisis happened and like Superman says, okay, this seems to be like the, the anti-life equation spreading through the digital sphere like it did in Final Crisis. It could be Superman just like analyzing these guys using what whatever vision he has, but but regardless of the scenario, Superman comes to the realization that it's spreading through TV and social media. And so, of course, we have Jonathan going to find his mom's phone and so on and so forth. As soon as he picks it up, Superman destroys it when he flies in through the window and then destroys the TV screen and says, nobody look at anything. Everybody close your eyes, chill. Everybody relax. From there, you switch over to Batman. And this is one of the coolest parts. So Batman, you know, being the detective that he is, is already on the case, right? Like Gotham's basically is lost. Batman shuts down like, like the entire connection of Wayne Manor to the internet. So the Batcave is not connected to any of the internet. In turn, he has all these uh, all these redundant loops. He's got Gotham City on close to some cameras. So basically, he shuts himself off from the world and then in turn starts analyzing all the footage that he sees and realizes like the whole place is going to pot. And when the question is how many people are, are infected right now, an estimated 600 million people have been infected in the first day. The entire world's population will be infected in a couple days. And basically, that's it. It's game over. And it's, and it's cool because from there, Batman basically issues like the EMP for Wayne Manor, shuts down the power to everything thing and then is, is essentially just kind of walking blind but technology has become the enemy of the world and that's one of the cool things about about tom taylor is there's always kind of a moral tale right i mean grant morrison is similar to that and i bring him up because of the you know we've been talking about final crisis the problem with grant morrison is nobody understands what grant morrison is doing except for himself and people who are fans who think they know what grant morrison is doing there's you know whatever but but regardless of the circumstance like there's always kind of a moral cautionary tale when it comes to tom taylor's stories and it's the the like the internet is the enemy of the world like social media is the enemy of the world, which technically is not wrong. But what you end up having is like this, this kind of discussion between Lois and Superman, Damien and, and Jonathan. And it's like, where's Batman? Like, is Batman going to make it? And this is kind of cool to see because one of the things that, that, that really sort of made Damien such an interesting character is that while he is 
as cold-blooded and ruthless and, and, and as an insanely talented killer the fact remains he's still a kid and it's cool to see that 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 child part of him come out he's worried about his dad is my dad going to be okay i love the way that's done and so what you end up doing is basically picking up with like batman kind of making his way through wayne manor and looking for alfred and looking for tim drake no i'm sorry D dick is who he's looking for tim drake is who he's also looking for but what batman ends up finding like once he finds alfred who thankfully is okay dick grayson is not dick grayson has been turned into a zombie so basically we have batman versus zombie dick grayson and it's kind Kind of cool. <laughs> It's pretty awesome to see. But in the middle of this whole fight, where you have Dick Grayson, suddenly you're met with the arrival of like Tim Drake. And so basically you've got zombie Tim Drake, you've got zombie Dick Grayson. Batman's made to face off against the both of them. He tells Alfred to run for his life. And like the last thing we see is Dick Grayson taking a chunk out of Batman's neck. Dick Grayson kills Batman. Okay, so picking up with Deceased number two, this story is, dude, this story is so good. Here's the thing about Tom Taylor writing, man. Tom Taylor writing is legit. Like, it's it's one, okay, Tom Taylor's really, really good at writing, like, dark stories, right? It's just like, things are popping off and people are dying. Get Tom Taylor to write it. Like, Tom Taylor's really good at that. I would not give, like, Captain America to Tom Taylor, although it probably would be a pretty cool story. It'd be dark, but it'd be probably a pretty cool story. Okay, somebody more upbeat, somebody more lighthearted, right? Like, I would not give a Spider-Man story to Tom Taylor. There we go. Like, I would I wouldn't give Spider-Man to Tom Taylor um, because he would write a pretty dark Spider-Man story. Uh, but the world's ending because like Cyborg released a virus onto the world, like like was a carrier for the anti-life equation, which spread through technology. Yeah, man, let Tom Taylor write that story. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it turns out exactly the way you would expect because again from the first video that we saw that's basically what's happening right like dark side had essentially found the anti-life equation uh, and the dark side was corrupted by this sort of twisted version of the anti-life equation that he that he essentially created and then in turn with cyborg being a carrier for it cyborg was was kind of teleported back to earth when like dark side became corrupt and went crazy and everything and then cyborg released it into the internet right like released it over the digital space which basically is kind of like this digital virus right so for those of you guys who saw who, who ever read uh cellular I think it was called Cellular by uh, by Stephen King. That's basically it, right? Like a virus that spreads throughout the world using digital information. And it works exceedingly well. And that's one of the things I like about this, right? Like if this was a direct copy of Marvel Zombies, well then something, 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 something. Now we have zombies, people are being bitten and they're turning into zombies, right? But like that's been done before. What better way to create a kind of zombie story more or less than to like have it spread through the internet like we saw in Final Crisis. It's a great way to do it. It's a, it's a really cool concept. And so in this one, we basically pick up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean with Aquaman. And Aquaman's just kind of like, okay, so like there's a boat out here in the middle of nowhere and like cargo's dumping everywhere and like things are popping off. What in the world's happening? And like when he opens this uh, this door of the ship in the hold, there's like monsters everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and Aquaman just flees for his life. This is kind of cool because what this does is it begs the question, can Atlantis be affected, right? Because like what you're talking, and, and we'll talk more about this here once we get towards the end of the video, because Tom Taylor kind of indirectly answers that question. Uh, but with Atlantis being so far below the surface and in a lot of ways being in a place where you kind of have to wear like a pressurized suit, otherwise the sheer pressure would probably crush you. It's a question of like, can people make it down there with no protection whatsoever in order to successfully infiltrate the place? But at this point, we kind of jump over to Metropolis, right? And so you got Jonathan Kent, you've got Damian Wayne, you've got Lois Lane, and you've got Superman. Now, now again, they're kind of picking up in the middle of all this, and that's the nature of this whole thing. Remember, it spread so far so fast. Like, it was like Skynet going live. In the blink of an eye, this virus was all over the world, and just like everything's kind of falling all at the same time. But it also restricts their ability to be able to access, to, to be able to speak to different people, right? Like, Lois Lane's response is, we have to go to the Daily Planet. But our, our first inclination is, that won't do you any good, because it's being spread to the digital space. So anybody who picks up like a cellular phone, or anything that's connected to the internet like a smartphone or something like that they're going to be infected by this anti-life equation so so you need something like a rotary phone right like you need something that's like old hat technology analog information and so it's kind of a, a cool little thing because presumably the daily planet has that now the other half of this is of course damian wayne's freaking out over batman and that's one thing i want you guys to notice is this story of course takes place in a it doesn't take place in the main dc continuity but it does include the characters as they exist right now right like damian wayne's a little bit older uh jonathan kent is of course older there's a couple steps that we can take to sort of of make this fit in the sense of like we can kind of assume that things haven't progressed the exact same way right like Jonathan was not taken by his grandfather into space and then aged up we can assume a lot of those things didn't happen so like Bendis you know this the Bendis's version of Superman doesn't take place in this universe instead they just kind of aged up accordingly right they're just some number of years older than they normally are and we can just kind of call it a day right like we can just sort of take those those leniences and 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 be, be done with it but uh, switching over to Harley Quinn this is an important thing because what this shows is not everyone's aware of what's going on and and for the most part 
even those who are aware of what's going on don't really seem to have the full understanding of what's happening, right? Like, picking up with Harley Quinn and Poison Ivy, there's no indication here that, like, zombies are infecting everything or anything like that. They're just kind of having a general conversation. Poison Ivy's like, hey, you gotta go in there and you gotta do your thing. When you come out, I'll be waiting for you in the Botanic Gardens. Everything's gonna be okay. Harley Quinn has no real idea what's going on, and neither seemingly does Poison Ivy. And so when Harley Quinn walks into this room, we of course realize she's talking to the Joker. She's like, hey, I came here to tell you I'm running off with Poison Ivy. I'm leaving here, uh, and I'm never coming back. Our life together is over. And it's at that point that we find out the Joker has basically been turned into one of these zombies. Now, here's a cool question to be asked here. Here's, here's the cool question that we need to ask here. If the Joker is one of these zombie monsters, is there any real difference? Like, that's the cool question to ask. And I guess it depends on which version of the Joker you're talking about, right? Like, if you're talking about Steve Englehart Joker, right? Like, the version that Batman the Animated Series was based off of, then, yeah, you probably see a pretty big difference. But if we're talking about, like, Scott Snyder, New 52, Death in the Family Joker, like, or Death of the Family Joker, like, honestly, I don't know if you'd see that huge of a difference. He would just seem more crazy than usual. Now, here's the thing I want to see. I want to see Zombie Joker versus the Batman Who Laughs. That's what I want to see. Let me tell you something, man. Dude, I would, I would pay, I'd pay however much money DC's charging to read that one shot. Oh, dude, they'd be like, it's $100 to read this. And I would be like, here you go. Like, I'd, I'd just be like, take my money. I wouldn't even care. It would be, it'd be amazing to see. But in this moment, Joker is basically infected by this virus, more or less, and uh, is presumably going to tear apart Harley Quinn. <laughs> and so from here, we actually shift over what, to what I think is one of the coolest moments in the entire, uh, the entire story, when we pick up outside of Metropolis. Now, again, this is kind of an important thing to bear in mind here. Unless you're in a major city, you, for the most part, don't really know what's going on. And that makes the most sense, right? I mean, those individuals who are in, like, major metropolitan areas are usually tapped in in more in the digital space than those who were in like outlying rural territories, right? I mean, as a guy who lived in Kentucky, Lexington and Louisville are the two biggest cities. And so everything outside of that, you got Richmond, you got Winchester, Versailles, Harrodsburg, and then you go out further and you run into places like Rock Castle County and things like that. And the further out you go, and even the closer you go east of the Appalachian Mountains, the less technologically advanced people become. And so when, you, when you're in that kind of an environment, when you're further out and you're not tapped into the digital space at the time that this goes down, you have no idea what's going on because you're so far removed from the environment around you. Now, you would kind of expect that like the various explosions that we're hearing and or seeing and things like that in Metropolis, at the very least that noise would reach the ear of like Black Canary and and, uh, and Oliver Queen, Green Arrow and Hal Jordan. You would expect that it would reach them, but for whatever reason it hasn't. Maybe they're just so far outside of Metropolis that they're not really picking up on it. But the cool thing is they're kind of going back and forth and, and having their own little banter. And it's actually kind of a cool tip of the nod. And the reason why is because if you're not really familiar with the history of Green Lantern, Green Arrow, it doesn't really resonate with you. But for those people who do, there's a lot of, of not really callbacks, but just kind of a great little bit of nostalgia here, right? Because like Green Lantern and Green Arrow, those two guys were brought together because their comics weren't really selling. And so DC merged them together and basically put them in a singular story where it was essentially a team-up book for like a number of years. And here's the funny thing is it was actually incredibly popular. Like it was it was insanely popular. You wouldn't expect it to be, but it was. Oh, it was hugely popular and people loved it because of the dynamic, right? You had the joking nature of Oliver Queen combined with the more serious tone of Hal Jordan. And you got some great stories by Neil Adams and Dennis O'Neill, right? Like Snowbirds Don't Fly, different things like that. But again, these guys have been exceedingly good friends for a very, very long time. And so that's why it's kind of cool to see them paired together. So for people who are fans of, of Green Arrow and, and Green Lantern, they kind of look at this and they say, hey, like this is a cool little throwback, a cool little tip of the nod to the to the old stories from yesteryear. Uh, but of course, you know, they're also kind of giving Hal Jordan a hard time because he's so serious all the time. So they're like, you're like the killjoy, right? Like like Oliver Queen jumps up and he was like, uh, he was like, Hal Jordan, you have the ability to suck the fun out of every situation. Welcome to the Killjoy Corps. Which in all honesty, I kind of want to see that, right? Like just a bunch of cynical jerks just going around and just being like i don't enjoy anything and nothing's fun or happy and i just complain about everything all the time so basically like a huge portion of twitter right like the killjoy core so so like I, I think it'd be funny like i think it'd be kind of interesting right just like like this this little mini series where it's just a bunch of like okay that's what you do you just like ba basically make it like people on twitter right people who are just like you know i just want to be upset about something so i'm just going to tweet about things that i'm angry about and hope that somebody listens and hope that i can fix my life even though i can't not by by tweeting on twitter uh but like i want to see like that that mini series just focus is on them, right? Like just some keyboard warrior at home trying to change the world from a lounge chair. Uh, I, I really want to see, <laughs> I really want to see that story. I think it would be hilarious. But nonetheless, uh, you know, once Hal Jordan actually like goes into his tent, that's when everything begins to go crazy, right? Because then it's just like, okay, so uh, he gets on his phone and then of course he's immediately hit with the virus and then starts losing his mind and then like busts out. So what we've got is basically like this zombified Hal Jordan as a Green Lantern wielding the power of a Green Lantern, a zombie Green Lantern. It's the coolest coolest thing ever. In a lot of ways, he almost reminds me of like a combination of the Sinestro Corps and the Red Lanterns, right? Because like the ring immediately says like lethal force is uh, lethal force is not uh, is not sanctioned, right? So like you cannot kill people. Now, here's a funny thing is 
it almost kind of seems like Sinestro Corps War never happened, right? Because Sinestro Corps War is when things change and the Green Lanterns could start killing people. So presumably like Sinestro doesn't exist or the Sinestro Corps War never took place. Whatever the case is, Green Lanterns can't kill folks. And so it's kind of crazy because like he's trying to kill them. Now here's where the, where the big saving grace comes in because then you've got like Oliver Queen who's basically attacked by Hal Jordan. Hal Jordan goes to kill him and then Dinah Lance, the Black Canary, just like screams in the face of Hal Jordan and just like destroys his eardrums. And it's a crazy thing because like it, it basically like, you know, scrambles his brains and it kills him. And then it's Hal Jordan, Green Lantern of, of Sector 2814 deceased, scanning for replacement, replacement found. Dinah Lance of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lanterns. And it's just like, wow, like it's the coolest thing. Never in my life did I think it would be cool to see Black Canary become a Green Lantern. But I'm excited about that because imagine what she can do with hard light constructs and a sonic scream. I'm really excited by it, right? I mean, you can tell there's obvious influence from Injustice in this story, right? Like taking someone's set of powers and throwing it onto somebody else that you would least expect and then just kind of seeing how things play out. There's obviously a lot of injustice going on in terms of how this story is being written, but it's 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 really, really awesome. Now, of course, once you end up having Superman and, and company, Superman, Damien, Jonathan, and Lois showing up at the Daily Planet, it's exactly what we would expect, right? You know, Superman's like, hey, stay here. This place is filled with monsters. So basically, you know, from, from what how Superman responds to Lois's question, is it people we know? Superman, of course, looks sad and says yes. So we can assume Perry White. We can assume Jimmy Olsen. We can assume a, a lot of the people who have traditionally been the supporting cast of the Superman comics are essentially infected and, and they're, they're you know, they're caught up by this virus. And so with this, this cool thing happening, Superman, of course, does the one thing you're never supposed to do. I'll be right back. <laughs> which usually never happens. That's never usually the case. But of course, the reason why he takes off is not to go into the Daily Planet. It's because he heard a scream. And that's when he races over and he ends up realizing that like, hey, like Black Canary is the Green Lantern. We need you to have these powers. Like we need you with us. You have to come along here. And so with that in mind, like with of course, Black Canary in tow, bringing Oliver Queen, they all basically show up here at, uh, you know, they, they kind of return to the Daily Planet. And that's when Batman chimes in. And it's like, okay. So Batman basically says, hey, look, they're not really zombies in the traditional sense. They don't desire to consume flesh. They're basically the anti-life, right? Like these are individuals who have been infected with the anti-life equation. All they want to do is spread this anti-life, right? So, you know, it's, it's kind of saying they're dead, but they're not dead. It's interesting because what Tom Taylor really kind of seems to indicate here, there may be a way to bring them back. But what Batman, what he really does is kind of clear that up right off the bat when Batman says, you can't cure them. There's no way to bring them back. Those individuals that we lost are now gone. Whatever percentage of the world's population is infected is now infected forever. And so if you're not tapped into a phone and you're bitten by one of these guys, you are now infected with anti-life. And the only way to basically deal with you is to kill you. So in a sense, they are basically zombies just by a different name, right? Like the only thing they lack is just consuming flesh. They're, they're zombies under a different circumstance. But again, this is actually a pretty sad moment because you've got, of course, got Alfred standing by with a shotgun and you've got Batman in the suit of Mr. Freeze, basically cooling his body down, slowing his metabolism and keeping the virus from like overrunning him. But he basically says like, there's no cure for me. There's nothing I can do here. Like I am going to die. Like I'm, I'm going to become one of those things. There's no way for me to, to kind of go back to who I was. And there's almost like some doubt here, right? I mean, Oliver Queen just like, no, 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 you're Batman, dude. Like Oliver Queen is like the voice of the fan, right? He's like, no, you're Batman, dude. Like you have prep time or, or, you know, some fill in the blank reason, but like you always come back from this. And it's kind of cool because Batman doesn't have prep time because Batman's not prepared for it, which of course always answers the question, what happens when Batman doesn't have prep time? He dies. So it's, it's kind of a cool little thing here. Like it's kind of a cool little moment of like Batman, like, like the world, like everybody's saying goodbye to Batman saying like, you know, there's no way we can bring you back. And, and this is, this is a really touching moment because Batman then starts talking to Damien and he's like, Hey, look, Look, like Alfred has something for you. It's something I always left for you. I knew you would earn it. Notice this is something Batman doesn't say. Batman doesn't say, I love you, son. Like he doesn't, he doesn't say, you know, I, I love you. You know, you're my son. Uh, you know, I mean, he, he of course dresses him as son, but he doesn't really say like, I love you and, and I always will or, or something along those lines. You don't really see that kind of tender moment, right? You just kind of see Batman being Batman where it's like, I left something for you. You would have earned it one day anyway. You would have taken this up, which of course we know that it's basically the bat suit that Damian Wayne is going to become Batman. And so it's, it's kind of a crazy thing because of course at that point in time, that's when Bruce begins to switch, right? Like that's when he starts to turn into this zombified version. And it's the craziest thing because Alfred does the only thing he can do. He says, cease transmission. It never should have interviewed you this way. I'm sorry, son. And then there's a shotgun fire. Okay, so picking up with uh, Deceased Part 3, this one's actually kind of sad. We talked about this in our Injustice videos, right? And we even talked about it in the first the first video or so of, of Deceased, that when it comes to Tom Taylor as a writer, while his stories can be exceedingly dark, Tom Taylor is very, very good at drawing out the human element of characters. It's one of the reasons why I love Alex Ross art so much, to kind of go off on a tangent for a second. You look at, like, the Alex Ross drawing of, like, the Justice League, or, like, the JSA, or something like that, and it almost makes you nostalgic for an era of comics 
groups that none of us were really part of when like there were good guys and bad guys and like that was it but it was more like the people behind the characters it's why the world's greatest superheroes i think is the greatest comic book miniseries of all time and this picks up essentially with alfred just kind of saying his goodbyes to some of the bat family right so to like tim drake and to batman and to, to dick grayson because all three of them are dead and whenever we read stories like this when characters die you know depending on how attached we are there's always like that one part of us that would that kind of wishes they were still there right like they kind of kind of holds out hope that like they'll come back you know and, and it's kind of interesting because it's like okay well maybe we missed something maybe they're not really dead you know maybe they're just like recovering or like batman's healing or something but like something has to happen that they come back and tom taylor just kind of seems to put out this indication of like no they're gone alfred basically takes you know the the bat wing and like leaves but the cool thing about this and one of the reasons why i like that so much is because this puts off the indication and it really shows how bleak things are that like heroes are dying left and right and they're not coming back and it's kind of the cool thing because while this is only really six issues long just from what i've seen so far i feel like it could be longer i mean anything more than nine and i think it would stretch on too much but from what we saw with like what is it uh batman the white knight like six issue miniseries can lead into something better which is what we're getting right we're getting a sequel to the to the white knight this looks really really awesome and so switching over to harley quinn like it's kind of a bit of 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 a moment for her right i mean when it comes to harley and dc comics this is one of the things that i've always kind of struggled with with her characters when it comes to harley and dc comics when she first popped up she was basically kind of a holdover from batman the animated series right that's where she originally appeared that's where she got her debut and there wasn't really a whole lot of development there it wasn't until a few years went by that dc started, started finally focusing and, and building on harley and then of course later on added her to the suicide squad and different things like that but the idea behind this is that her character has always for for a long time sort of existed under the shadow of the joker that's what she was best known for but for the for her character inside the comics she's under the shadow of joker right like he's the guy who taunts her he's the guy that, that makes her life a living hell and the guy she always goes back to and so where she's always kind of tried to make an escape in this one we get a kind of finality here right i mean the joker is 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 zombified right i mean he's a zombified version of the joker he's a zombie harley quinn like grabs a shotgun and like blows him in half right just like shoots him and kills him or at least you know seems to kill him now one of the things that that haven't really been hasn't really been established here by tom taylor at least not outright specifically is that if a person is kind of turned into one of these quote-unquote zombies which he's kind of said they're not really zombies but they basically are if a person's turned into a zombie and then in turn like they are killed by traditional means can they come back and i don't think that's explicitly been stated yet right i mean a person can be turned into a zombie but the, but there's no indication they can actually come back from that if they've been killed but still like at, at the moment right now the joker's just kind of shot and killed and, and that seems to be the end of that and then harley's met by the birds of prey right so like huntress and catwoman and batwoman and batgirl so basically like a majority of the superhero community are now being turned into these zombie things and that's why i say it's so cool it's because everybody's back really seems to be up against the wall it's the end times right like things are falling apart it almost kind of seems like a fast-tracked version of injustice right i mean injustice you know things pop off the joker kills uh or really tricks superman into killing lois and their unborn child a bomb gets blown up or you know is detonated and wipes out uh, metropolis and then over the course of like an entire year or really two years depending on how you want to look at it superman goes from like this guy who was a superhero to like a, a a full-on villain and so it's kind of a cool thing because you look at that and it's like fast-tracked right it's like things are falling apart things are, are basically breaking apart exceedingly fast but it works because if this were to happen and if some kind of zombie plague were to manifest and be spread through digital information then it would happen this fast right i mean as often as people are on their phones surfing the web looking at youtube videos different things like that people are constantly wired in and connected and so if there if there were some kind of digital virus that could convert people into like these monstrous zombie things it would happen like that the, the world would be conquered within a day and a half only rural villages and towns would be the ones would be the last affected because they're really more disconnected than, than like major metropolitan areas but again it's a cool thing and so switching over to Damien this is a part of him that we usually never get to see when you have Damien like he's basically facing the fact that like his father's dead and for Damien Wayne historically speaking as a character he's almost seemed disconnected from his own humanity right I mean he was basically conceived by Talia al Ghul in basically like a pretty screwed up scenario with Batman and then in turn like raised among the the League of Assassins and then basically taught to be like this prodigious killer right like the human element was never really part of it he was just taught to kill and it wasn't until he was brought to batman and raised by bruce that bruce tried to instill that human element in him right it's the nature of the progression of his character going from what was essentially a killing machine to becoming a killing machine who is also human and so because of that <laughs> because we never really get to see this kind of moment in him it's actually pretty touching because jonathan sits down with him and where damian wayne doesn't want to talk jonathan's response is okay well then i'll, I'll go ahead and just sit here uh, so that you don't have to be alone it's a very important thing and on the surface it kind of seems like okay well that's interesting 
This is probably one of the most important displays of friendship that Jonathan's ever shown to Damien. And the reason why is because sometimes it's not all about just being there and like giving the right answers all the time and saying, saying everything you need to say to just make a person feel better. Sometimes it's just being there. Like the knowledge of you being there is enough and that's all they need. All they need is to know that you're there and that's that's it. That's, that's the only comfort they need. Everything else they can deal with internally and when the time comes when they're ready to talk, they will. It's a very important life lesson that I think not a few people, not enough people learn. Being there is important. That's the most important thing. So again, you know, you have Superman and you have Lois who actually stay hands off. The same thing with, with Oliver Queen and with Dinah Lance, they kind of stay hands off and they're like, we'll just leave them there and we'll just let them be friends and whatever happens, happens. It's a really, really cool moment. But Superman's response is also kind of focusing on other things because he kind of keeps mulling over him to himself, you know, how Damien's feeling. Damien just lost his dad and then it clicks. Superman's response is, I have to go home. I have to go to Smallville. And initially it's kind of like, okay, you know, Lois is like, okay, I understand you have to do that. But Superman is kind of like, okay, what, what we need to do is create a safe space for you guys and this is the this is one of the coolest moments in the story because when this happens superman uses his x-ray vision he looks throughout the entirety of the daily planet and he has to differentiate between who's infected and who's not and what he says here is that those who are infected cannot be brought back and so he has to stop looking at them like they're human beings and look at them strictly as the enemy and that's a crushing thing for superman to have to do right because he's the guy who always sees the best in things who always sees hope superman embodies hope and to suddenly thrust himself into a position where he has to look at people and say there is no hope is devastating. There are people he's worked with for years. You know, Jimmy Jimmy Olsen, like Perry White, they're family. And so with that being the case, it's literally him having to eliminate his own family members because there's no way to save them. It's, it's an absolutely devastating role to have to take on. The hardest part of this whole situation is separating himself from his own humanity. It's the hardest thing to do. And it's so cool to see it done that way, right? I mean, it's things like this, these kind of cool, introspective, deconstructive stories with Superman in them that make him more interesting. Thing, right? I mean, because Superman, he's the original superhero. He flies, he punches. That's not interesting. What makes it interesting is when you focus on him as a character in these scenarios where he has to kind of cast aside everything he's known and become something different, even if only for a brief amount of time. And so it's a, it's a cool little moment here because then you switch over to Atlantis and you've got Mera and then you've got Garth learning how to use his powers as Tempest or at least controlling them in a more finite level and Mera being the one to teach him, right? But remember, Atlantis is for the most part isolated from the surface world. And aside from Aquaman, you know, realizing that like the surface is going to pot and we haven't seen what he he's been doing. Nobody else in Atlantis knows what's going on. There's no reason for them to be concerned. But it's suddenly in the midst of all this, the water starts turning dark. And for me, it was it was kind of confusing for a second. I was like, why in the world is the water turning dark? Like, you know, and, and it was kind of wild because when that happened, like you literally find out that what Aquaman's been doing is attacking and killing everyone. Not only that, like Aquaman presumably has been attacking like animals, sharks and things like that because they're now consuming people. Either that or Aquaman is sending out like subtle commands to the sharks saying like kill everyone. So like it, it could be one or the other, but literally like this is all just blood in the water and that's what Mira says like stay away from the blood like do not make contact with the blood but for Garth it's too late and so with Mira using her powers to essentially control water she makes her escape and it's actually kind of a cool little thing because what she could do here is create a kind of safe pocket around herself everywhere she goes but remember Mira's powers can be mentally exhausting she's gonna have to make her way to the surface she's gonna have to seek out what's left of the superheroes but when she gets to the surface then she's gonna realize how dire things are that the world is essentially over and so it's kind of cool because with Superman making his way one of the things he says is like like for him as a hero his job is to be there for as many people as he can but the problem he faces right now is that like everyone needs him and so of course he comes across black lightning he comes across Je uh, comes across jefferson pierce jefferson pierce is actually kind of cool you never really see him that much in like these crossover events i mean i think it's really he's more pronounced now than he has been before because he's got his own show it, with jefferson pierce is kind of interesting it's kind of a combination of like a, like innate abilities not really innate abilities but like abilities unto himself as well as using like some kind of magic and mysticism to create like black lightning but still it's it's, it's kind of cool with this whole thing because when he shows up like it's basically him fighting fighting Clayface because Clayface is infected and is like turning into like this giant tentacle monster like attacking everything in sight. We only see Jefferson Pierce for a short amount of time uh, but it is kind of cool because you get to see that like hey look there's some guys here. One of the things that I dig about this is that this almost kind of feels like a movie. It's, it's an interesting little scenario but when he gets back home to Smallville of course he's met by his mother Martha and she's like your father's inside. I hit him over the head. Something's wrong with him and then of course when Superman gets in there it turns out that his father's infected. Now this kind of makes sense. The idea of Jonathan uh, of Jonathan Kent dying it's part and parcel to his character, right? I mean, it's what happens with him. And so when you have this scenario unfold where like Superman gets home and like his father's infected, it's one of the most touching moments in the story because usually whenever Jonathan Kent died, it was circumstances outside of Superman's control, right? Like either he wasn't there or it was something that he couldn't have helped, whatever the case was, whether it was in like the Man of Steel movie where he gets whisked away by a tornado and which 
of course, is a result of him making one of the dumbest decisions ever. Like, hey, son, like, rescue them and rescue me because you're super fast and you could easily do it. No, just stay there and don't save me because the world doesn't need to know you exist. Okay, I'm pretty sure that if Superman was like, hey, look, guys, I really had to do this. I had to rescue my dad. Please just don't tell anybody who I am. And they would be like, yeah, man, we understand, dude. Like, it's cool. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't run off to the papers and say, hey, man, there's this guy who can fly in, in like, Smallville. Uh, you guys should definitely write a report about him. It was, it was clearly, like, terrible writing on behalf of Zack Snyder, which is what he used usually does but but nonetheless like his father normally dies right and so like in, in those circumstances where it's outside superman's control in this circumstance it is like superman literally has to put his put his humanity aside in the most extreme scenario ever and say okay like my father's here i'm going to leave him here you would expect like what i would would have expected is that he would have killed him i know a lot of people would have disagreed with that and a lot of people would have said no that's dumb that's stupid you know yada 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 so on and so forth i think it would have been awesome because it would have been really one of these moments that really kind of doesn't really snap superman but really shows how dire things are that Superman has to kill his own pops, but leaving Smallville and leaving him there, it kind of, you know, leaving him confined down in there, unless he has the strength to break out, which he doesn't, Superman basically sealed it closed with his with his uh, heat vision, it kind of works, because assuming that he didn't find a way out, then he would just be kind of stuck down there forever, but if he did find a way out, well, then there goes Smallville, like everybody in Smallville is going to be, be infected, so potentially, Superman's doomed his entire hometown, assuming they weren't really dead already, but it's it's kind of a cool thing, and it's a, it's a, it's a cool moment, like the story's awesome, and I think it's a lot better than people are giving it, cre uh, giving it credit for Okay, so we're picking up with DC's part four, and I feel like Captain Adam fans are gonna be a little bit pissed. <laughs> because this actually reminds me of Kingdom Come, if I'm being honest with you guys, it reminds me a lot of Kingdom Come. So, so DC, as we know, is basically the anti-life equation turned into a viral form that's infected the world. And it was cool to see it used this way, right? Like the only real implementation that we saw with the anti-life equation being used on a global scale was during Final Crisis. And it was really more just like taking the will away from people, but weaponizing it and turning it into a system to where it basically creates zombies more or less is actually pretty intriguing. Now we will get some clarification in terms of what all this is and how it works, but again, this sort of switches over to Captain Adam. And again, Captain Adam's always kind of just been like a government man, you know, kind of part of Cadmus and all that kind of stuff, basically like a, a government guy. But with the world sort of popping off the way that it is, Captain Adam is really sort of their ace in the hole insofar as he's a guy that can go toe to toe with Superman. And there's no real knowledge or guarantee that Superman's actually survived out there. And even if there was, there's no real reason to believe that Superman would abandon everything and basically fight on behalf of the government, right? On behalf of like Amanda Waller and all those folks. There's no reason to believe that and he wouldn't. And so basically they end up turning to Captain Adam, which being a powerhouse, a man made of living energy in and of himself is a pretty cool thing to do. Now, what we also end up finding out here is that Ray Palmer, the Adam, has actually gone directly into one of these monsters, more or less, one of these zombies, and is essentially analyzing the whole thing in terms of what's going on inside of it. And so as a result of this, of course, Captain Adam is sent out and basically said, hey, look, try to curtail the threat as much as you can. And he does the best he can, but then suddenly we end up realizing what's going on. And this is actually a genius move by Tom Taylor. I never would have thought of this, that what ended up happening here is that when the Adam, when Ray Palmer went into this zombie, he was immediately infected, right? Because he was just exposed to the, to the equation. And when that happened, he came out as the Adam and then went into Captain Adam, which is really cool. It's, it's actually a genius idea and immediately started infecting him. The difference here is that instead of Ray Palmer killing Captain Adam in the traditional sense, what he actually ended up doing was quote unquote destabilizing him, right? Because he's a being made of living energy. So all you have to do is destabilize him and then suddenly he just turns into a giant bomb. And that's why I say it's really reminiscent of the events of Kingdom Come, right? Because in that story, he was ripped open. And so it was like all this atomic energy started pouring out and that's really what kind of led to the conclusion of the story, right? Like Captain Adam gets ripped open, Superman flies him into the air as fast as he can. Oh no, I'm sorry, I think it's Shazam who does it. Uh, well, anyway, one of the heroes does it and basically ends up dying in the process, I think. And then basically like it kind of ushers in a new era of peace for the world. But it's, it's, it's essentially the same thing. Like Captain Adam is basically going nuclear. He's getting ready to detonate and kill everyone. And so this it's kind of a cool moment because then you switch back over to uh, Superman and Green Arrow and the new Green Lantern. If you look at it as each individual issue, it seems like it takes place over the span of like days or weeks or something like that. But if you just kind of focus on it and, and kind of look at it as the greater whole, almost like you're reading it in trade, it takes place over the course of hours. Maybe five or six hours have passed since like the beginning of this whole thing. And so when you see it that way, no wonder they're all still hanging out at the Daily Planet. But of course, Superman showing up here, the, the real question here is if you go out there and you try to 
start rescuing people, you could be exposed to like a TV screen or some kind of digital device, and you'll be exposed to the virus and you'll turn. And this is actually, again, this is another genius moment. It's the small thing. See, it's the small things that make Tom Taylor's stories so cool. It's the small little tidbits that make his story so awesome. Because what Superman says is there's no risk of that because I've been using my x-ray vision the entire time since this whole thing popped off. And it's like, man, that's, that's like, that's actually pretty genius, right? Because using his x-ray vision, of course, he's able to make out just enough of the, the individual's costumes or what it is that they're wearing to know who they are, but also probably just the sound of their voice, different things like that. It's small little things like that. And so that's why it's so cool is because it's like, they end up sending out basically like an SOS to the world. And so you end up finding out that, that like Beast Boy, Hawk Girl, Lex Luthor, and presumably his sister, Lena, like they're alive. And it's kind of like, we all need to band together and try to save the world as best we can. It's a cool moment because then you switch over to Wonder Woman on Themyscira, you know, and, and her talking to, to Hippolyta is just kind of like, hey, look, I have to do this. Like, I can't stay here. Yes, this is my home and I'm safe here, but like my duty is to, to protect the world. And of what hero am I if I don't protect the world? And so then you basically end up having, uh, you end up having Superman and company travel over to Keystone City and meet with Barry Allen and meet with Wally West. But this is a cool thing because one of the things that they were told when this whole thing popped off, Batman immediately got a hold of him and said, do not go anywhere. Go somewhere where there is no technology of any kind. Stay there. Don't go anywhere. And, and it's, it's actually, it makes perfect sense, right? Because if any of the flashes, if any of the speedsters, you know, managed to, to contract this virus, the world would be over like that. There'd be no survivors. I mean, you're talking about people who can move up to the speed of light. And if they want to enter the speed force at the speed of light, uh, and then if they enter the speed force with this, who the hell knows what's going to happen, right? So you're talking about guys who can vibrate from one dimension to another. So it, it would be, it'd be catastrophic. It would take this global pandemic and elevate it to becoming a multiversal pandemic. The entire multiverse would just collapse because of the speedsters vibrating from one universe to the next and killing everything they see. I love these little nuggets, man. <laughs> I love these little tidbits. It's so cool to see this. And so what you end up getting, of course, is, is basically like this sound of thunder, right? Just kind of emanating and, and making its way to them. And that's when you actually find out, <laughs> you find out that it's Giganta, right? Like one of the villains of, of Wonder Woman. It's just like colossal woman. Now, of course, she's she's dealt with relatively quick insofar as like, you know, the Batwing comes flying out of nowhere and crashes into her, or at least she grabs it and then crushes it. Now, of course, once Superman and company shows up, Superman manages to knock her down. Wonder Woman actually goes to kill her. And this is one of the things I disagree with with Superman. You know, Superman's like, no, wait, you can't kill her yet. Batman said they're only infected, so maybe there's hope. And it's like, no, Superman, they're gone. Like they're they're dead, man. It's time to let go, Supes. Like I get that you're the Boy Scout. I get there's always a good, there's always a way, but sometimes there's not home slice. Sometimes there's nothing you can do and you just gotta let him go. The cool thing about this is the work it's done for him when Cyborg blows a hole in her head. Now, can we just all like, let's look at this for a second. All right, Cyborg fans, you're finally getting your due. Can we all just say, this looks badass. Cyborg standing behind like a, like a, a, a giant woman's head and he just blew a hole in it. Like, can we just say that's amazing? Like, it looks awesome. <laughs> it really does. Like, it looks, and see, this kind of stuff is why I love comics, man, because it's just, it, it's the tits. Like, it's it, it looks badass. Like, let's, all, let's, let's take a moment of silence for how awesome this is. Okay. So having said that, <laughs> this is when we kind of get the explanation of what it is that's going on, right? And, and what Cyborg really kind of clarifies here, of course, you do have Alfred who shows up and makes Damian Wayne the new Batman. Now, this is a pretty sentimental thing. One of the big things when it came to Damian, assuming that the history between this version of his character and the main DC universe history is that he's kind of been reforming himself after being trained to be just like this heartless assassin, you know, by, by Talia al Ghul, uh, by his biological mother. You know, assuming that that history is still relatively the same, he's always been trying to work to become the best version of himself. And for Batman to pass down the mantle to him solidifies a few things. One, it solidifies his father's faith in him. Bruce Wayne believes that Damien is capable of becoming Batman, but it also solidifies the fact that his father's dead, that there's no coming back for Batman, that he's gone. He's out of the picture. There's no other members of the Bat family. Damien is the last one left. And that's kind of got to be a crushing sensation, right? To sit down, like to wake up one day and realize that like your, your surrogate brothers and sisters are all dead, that your biological father is dead. Everyone you know and love is dead, shy of Alfred. He's the only guy left. And, and it's, it's a, it's a, rough thing to see, right? Because in the midst of all this, he just cries in the arms of Alfred. And that's it's that's what I love about this because it's so human, right? Like Damian Wayne seems to be a kid who's so disconnected from his humanity. And you see something like this and it's just so human and it's so cool. And I I, I, I dig, like, I love this. I love writing like this. Like I love writing that focuses so much on the characters. It focuses so much on like who they are kind of at their core. And so that's when Cyborg chimes in and says, okay, so these guys aren't really dead in the traditional sense, right? They're not like Night of the Living Dead zombies. They're facsimiles is all they are. They're facsimiles 
advocates of the anti-life equation. That the anti-life equation is exactly what it stands for, anti-life. And they will spread anti-life, i.e. death, everywhere they go. Now, this is Tom Taylor taking the anti-life equation in the most literal sense, right? Take, taking it and using it for its namesake and saying the anti-life equation is anti-life. It exists to basically replace life with death. And again, that flies in the face of the traditional sense. And so I imagine there'll be some who, are just, who kind of, you know, kind of snub at that and say, no, 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 no. That's not what the anti-life equation is. It was never meant to be that way. It just dominates the wills of people because that's what Jack Kirby wanted. That's what it needs to be. Honestly, I don't really care one way or the other. It makes for a cool story. Uh, but basically it's Cyborg saying that like, they're not human anymore. There's no way to bring them back. You can't fix them. You can't save them. There's nothing we can do. They will find life. Anywhere there is life, they will find it. The only way for us to do that is to leave here, is to get out of here. And so that's why it's kind of crazy because in the midst of all this, suddenly they're met by the arrival of Hawkgirl who says, hey, look, Captain Adam is, is getting ready to explode. He's getting ready to wipe everything out. And so as a result of this, Captain Adam, as, as soon as he as soon as he detonates, right? You've got Wonder Woman and you've got Superman that whisk him up into the air as fast as they can. But when he detonates, all of Washington, D.C. goes with it, right? So what's left of the government's gone now. There's no organizing structural force anymore. There's no real military. And if there is a military, they don't know who they're taking their orders from. So there's no real government left anymore. There's nobody making the decisions. All that stuff's basically gone. The outlying territories, Baltimore, they're all basically gone. And the last one to be hit is Metropolis. And so what this looks like is seemingly almost everybody's going to die. Now, if I'm a betting man, I'd probably bet here that basically the Green Lantern is going to conjure a shield that will protect everyone. But essentially what this will mean is that everybody in their immediate vicinity is gone. All the heroes that were there are dead. All the villains that were there are dead. And they're going to have to kind of go back out into the world and see if they can save who they can. But again, this is Tom Taylor. If this was Warren Ellis, I would say it's going to be unnecessarily bleak and they're all going to die these hor like these horrendous radiated deaths, you know, where they all die of radiation sickness or something like that. But this is Tom Taylor. There's usually light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm, I'm curious to see where this goes. I'm really excited to see how this ends. Okay, so we are getting back into Deceased, and here's the thing, we actually missed one of the tie-in stories. There's actually, you have the main Deceased title itself, which is six issues, and then you have A Good Day to Die. And initially, I didn't really plan on covering A Good Day to Die, uh, mostly because I didn't read it. And then I sat down and read it, and I was like, this is amazing, we need to cover this. <laughs> because Deceased itself, the main six issue limited series, uh, it deals largely with the most well-known superheroes, right? The cool thing about the, the A Good Day to Die is it deals with like some still pretty prominent superheroes, but actually kind of takes a from a different direction. So it's really, really cool the way it goes down. So initially this picks up with Scott Free and Big Barda. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, we're gonna do a lot of explaining in this for people who are unfamiliar with it. But for, for Scott Free and, and Big Barda, or at least Mr. Miracle, as a lot of you guys probably know him, and Big Barda, their home is essentially apocalypse. For Mr. Miracle, it was, and then sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. The way this works in, in DC Comics is you have two worlds, more or less. After the events on Christ on Infinite Earth, they were actually in a singular universe. As it exists now in the New 52 and, and as part of DC Rebirth, they're actually out there in their own place, um, really within the multiverse itself. But you end up having the, the planet of Apocalypse and the planet of New Genesis. And they're really designed to kind of represent good and evil. That's how they were designed by Jack Kirby when he wrote The Fourth World. But the idea is that New Genesis is home to High Father, and of course, Apocalypse is home to Darkseid. And the initial basis behind this is that the two groups were basically at war with each other. And so in order to broker a peace, uh, a being by the name of Metron came along and basically had them swap sons. So so essentially, the son of High Father went over to, uh, went to Apocalypse, and the son of Apocalypse went to New Genesis. And so as a result, it was a way to basically keep the peace so that neither would destroy the other's world and by virtue of that, kill their own sons. With Scott Free, with him, with him going over to Apocalypse, he basically just lived like this really crappy life where he was in a cell all the time. Eventually, he learned how to pick the lock. And because this, the, the locks for Apocalypse were so difficult to pick, ultimately it meant that he basically became like the best lock picker ever. But nonetheless, Big Barda was part of the Furies. And the Fury was basically like an all-female team with some occasional guys in there uh, that served as, as basically like agents of, of Apocalypse and were trained by Granny Goodness. It was, it's a pretty cool idea, but essentially these two folks are basically like, okay, like Darkseid's dead, Apocalypse has been destroyed, uh, now we gotta leave. Now there is no reference here to New Genesis. There's no reference to it. Uh, we can assume it exists. I mean, the, the two kind of exist in opposite poles to one another, but there's no reference to it. So we can just kind of, you know, roll with that. But what it does is it switches over to uh, Michael Holt, also known as Mr. Terrific. Now, again, Mr. Terrific is one of the smartest people in the world. I think he's probably in the top three, but Mr. Terrific has basically been conducting uh, experiments on Captain Boomerang, right? Like an infected person. He's and exposed him to another dose of the virus to see if there's any kind of change. There's no stimulus, no response to, to being touched or anything like that. So essentially, he's just sort of a, a of a, a non-human entity, right? Like whatever sense of humanity he had has long since been gone. Now, and so where you end up having Scott Free and Barda who go back to their apartment, uh, they end up getting a knock on the door. And this is one of the reasons why I love Scott Free, right? Because he's 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 a, a humorous character. If he's written correctly, like he's supposed to be, he's hilarious. <laughs> and initially, like he makes this comment, like when they hear a knock at the door, it's like, well, maybe some of 
somebody with like a bloody stump. <laughs> <laughs> I have no earthly clue. Of course, once they answer it, it turns out to be Mr. Terrific. But it's one of these things where he's essentially been analyzing the, the whole situation. Now, of course, this is a role that would normally be reserved for Batman. But as we know, Bruce Wayne's basically dead. He's he's out of the picture now. And so because of this, Michael Holt's been trying to deduce and trying to figure out what's going on. And ultimately, his initial idea was if the virus originated from Apocalypse, then we can travel there and we can basically try to find a cure. No guarantees there, but now it's basically out the window because Apocalypse has been completely destroyed. And so following that, the response is, well, then we only have one other real choice that we can use we can basically try to invoke like the powers of magic and so what it does is it transitions over to cord industries with booster gold and with uh with with uh, ted cord himself the blue beetle now again this is kind of a cool thing but this is something else that's sort of interesting here is because of the nature of the situation and the nature of the story normally we would expect tom taylor to write booster gold not so much in a in a goofball way i mean he really is kind of a goofy character but we would expect him to be written in a way where he's more of like not really the comic relief but something close to it and this he's not not written that way. Now, the cool thing about that, and this is one of the reasons why so many fans love Booster Gold, is because depending on who's writing the story, he can be a very dynamic character. If it's a writer that doesn't really care anything about him, he's done in a throwaway fashion, right? It's just kind of like, here's the guy who's a goofball, he's a buffoon, and you throw him away that way. Uh, but if, if he's written effectively, he can be one of the more dynamic characters in the entirety of, of DC, right? Because he's the guy that everybody knows is basically a dude from the future who went to the past uh, and, and essentially faked being a hero from the future in order to try to be a hero in the present day. Because he was a loser in the future, he's always got a kind of uh, a chip on his shoulder. But in this instance, it's one of these pretty hardcore situations because with everything sort of popping off the way that it is, the response is like, we basically need you guys. Like, like we need you, Booster Gold, in order to help us, you know, achieve this particular goal. But before we do this, we're going to see if we can't find a way to cure it with magic. And so, of course, what they end up doing is traveling to England and we pick up with John Constantine. Now, the funny thing about this is that magic in DC is, is sort of intriguing, right? For those of you guys who are reading DC Rebirth right now, uh, or I guess really it's DC Universe now, there was a big reference to, to how magic works works, right? Especially in Doomsday Clock. That initially magic was just a thing that existed in DC and it kind of had some, some ties to a bit of reality warping. And then it was also sort of tried and true witchcraft and wizardry. What Dr. Manhattan revealed by virtue of, of Doomsday Clock is that all people who are doing when they manipulate magic is they're essentially manipulating reality, but on a much smaller scale. And they're doing it with what are essentially the leftovers of, of, of the various properties of, of the universe that are out there. But the fact remains here that it's kind of being treated in this situation, or at least being viewed by Mr. Terrific, it's kind of a catch-all, right? Like, if we have people who can use magic, we can just sort of wish it all away and everything will be okay and then everything will be fine, that'll be it. You know, of course, picking up with Constantine, we learned that's not the case. And the reason why is because of this guy fleeing for his life, if magic could easily be used or could be channeled in a way to where it could essentially solve solve all the problems, well, then all it would take is like Dr. Fate and Zatanna and a handful of other people, probably Etrigan, to come along with Constantine and then go from city to city, snapping their fingers and everything will be okay or one great big huge giant spell that they create in order to cure the world and everything would be done in like one issue. But with Constantine fleeing for his life like this and then ultimately having to incinerate his best friend Chaz who's been converted it really kind of shows us that like there's no real hope here and that's what Constantine tells Mr. Terrific right when Terrific shows up and says hey look like essentially like we need magic in order to, to, to basically cure this the response of Constantine is like well, what do you think I can do just snap my fingers and everything is fixed buddy if I could have done that I would have done it a long time ago it doesn't work that way like magic doesn't work that way and and even if it did these folks can't be saved in that fashion they're not human anymore the only thing you can really do is is kill them and so as a result of this because magic is not an option, they move on to plan C. And that involves Booster Gold basically going back in time, manipulating the time stream in order to keep the, the initial infection from breaking out. And so where everybody essentially shows up here and then all hell breaks loose as soon as they arrive, right? You got like Big Barda and Scott Free who basically fall, they end up dying or at least being consumed by these zombies. Once Ted Cord and once Mr. Terrific and Booster Gold get inside this room, they're immediately met by Wave Rider. Now, Wave Rider is an old school character. Well, not super old school, but he's relatively old school. He appeared back in 1991 with a story called Army get in 2001. And the idea behind this story, as it was written by Archie Goodwin, is it was basically designed to kind of show like possible futures, right? It was the first real instance of DC uh, basically portraying the possibility of time travel and even even sort of invoking to a degree the aspect of hypertime, which would later be sort of evolved even more by, by Mark Wade and, uh, and, and Grant Morrison, but sort of showing like possible futures for the various characters that were out there. Now, it was a two-issue miniseries with a whole bunch of tie-ins to it, but Wave Rider was basically a guy who came from a future where some hero in the, in the modern day would basically go forward and end up killing all the superheroes and uh, his goal was to prevent that and so after learning how to or really being endowed with the ability to manipulate the time stream this led to him becoming the character of Ray, uh, wave rider and then becoming one of the linear men and the linear men are basically like like time police is really what they are right like their job is to, to monitor the time stream and to make sure nobody does anything that's supposed to screw stuff up and this is a really smart move by tom taylor because the reality is that dc's as it's written is exceedingly good and, and in truth tom taylor would have essentially just kind of pissed it all away
way had it turned into a situation where time travel everything's fixed it really goes into a scenario where the wave rider says you cannot manipulate the time stream like this is the fate of your universe you can't escape this this is how it's supposed to unfold sorry about your luck i don't know what to tell you like <laughs> it's kind of funny the way it plays out <laughs> it's kind of messed up the way it plays out but initially constantine didn't want to have anything to do with this right he's like you guys go off and do your own thing i'm gonna go teleport to some place i'm gonna find a bar and i'm just gonna get drunk until everything around us comes crashing down and so as a result of this you know there, there really doesn't really seem to be an alternative or an ability to stop wave ride right i mean you're talking about a guy who can manipulate quantum energy he could incinerate ted cord and booster gold like that right in the blink of an eye and his job here even is to basically arrest booster gold and to take him back to the future and so because of this john constantine sitting in this bar basically sort of recants and says okay fine gotta go be a hero right i mean his conscience gets the better of him and so as a result of that he shows up he headbutts uh wave rider <laughs> and then basically says i'll hold him off only for the entire group to be met with the arrival of big barda who literally rips mr terrific in half which is kind of insane to see and so all you really have left is booster gold blue beetle then you got constantine holding off wave rider as best he can but because of the fact that that michael holt's been killed and because of the fact that in the next part of this video that we're going to talk about here in a second that an event's taken place and we'll we'll cover that you know once we get to it that basically the future where booster gold comes from doesn't exist anymore humanity as it exists in his timeline is gone and so because of that it's kind of cool to see that like linear time is maintained meaning that whatever happens in the present day affects the future it's an absolute outcome essentially booster gold ceases to be he basically fades from existence and so as a result of that there's no real means to travel back in time and to fix everything and then of course in response to that constantine bonds himself to wave rider and basically says where you go i go there's no way for you to escape from me but the problem with that is that basically wave rider's out of the picture now <laughs> wave rider's been destroyed because he's killed by ted court and so again it's a really good way for tom taylor to kind of say hey are we going to use time travel no we're not and then just move on to the next thing because following that with it all kind of going belly up and all the plans and really all these superheroes being killed suddenly you have the arrival of zatanna dr fate bobo and a couple of, a couple other people who basically say hey look like this world is doomed there's nothing you can do here come with us and and we're just going to move on to a better place and wait for whatever happens next and the response of constantine is not a chance the world doesn't end until i say it does and so at this point we switch over to dc's number five itself and this is one of the really cool things because what it does is it shows the response of humanity and the process of how all this went down specifically the governments and what it shows us is that like all the major or at least some of the you know three of the major cities in the u.s have been totally obliterated washington dc baltimore and metropolis totally incinerated and completely gone and it's kind of crazy to see because the green lantern was able to save a handful of people here and there but for the most part virtually everybody in metropolis is dead and one of the crazy things about this and it's one of the coolest moments in the story you know finding out that lex luther is alive and where superman shows up on his doorstep you know shows up there with the intention of kind of being like what's one more dead body lex luther actually breaks down and it's a great moment here it's, it's insanely cool the way it's written because when you have these two guys you know the the, the battles between lex luther and, and superman are timeless right they're some of the greatest conflicts that you're ever going to see because it's the mind of lex luther against the brawn of superman right and despite how smart superman is it usually comes down to a physical altercation although sometimes it does sort of focus on battles of the mind but here lex luther just sort of begins to cry and just says like look what happened to our city and that's the most important you know the most important takeaway here is that more important than any one of these two guys is their allegiance how much they value the city of metropolis because it's their home and so it's a it's a beautiful moment here because they have common ground our entire city has been totally obliterated all we really have left is each other and so what tom taylor does is give us a kind of timeline and say over the course of the next few days and then the next few weeks various efforts are undertaken in order to sort of try to save what's left of humanity right like all these various servers are destroyed by the flash all around the world so the internet is taken down as best as it can be you end up having like mass satellites that are out there that are broadcasting you know tv shows or, or radio signals or whatever it is those are taken out by wonder woman all these things are, are basically implemented by the superheroes in order to take down modern technology not only that what they also need is a refuge right because if earth is almost completely overrun then what's left of of humanity that has not been infected needs a place to stay otherwise it's only a matter of time before they're completely destroyed and so what it does is it leads to wonder woman traveling to paradise island and basically saying like we need to house people here and for the most part this is a big no-no right paradise island is cut off from everything like it's one of these things where sort of like no one comes here people aren't allowed to be here we don't let men onto our island it's just something you don't do it's something that you just don't see and it's kind of a cool thing because in response to this wonder woman's statement is basically i'm a protector of earth i'm here to protect the world and if humanity has fallen this fast and there's superheroes around there and superheroes have fallen how long do you really think it'll be before people show up here 
here. And so in order to basically keep this place protected as best we can, one, we need to have individuals out there who are who are innocents, who did nothing wrong and are just cut in the whole, you know, caught up in the whole circumstance. We need to be able to house them here because it's the right thing to do. And two, we need to take what's left of the superhero community and provide some measure of protection, right? Because where the Amazons are powerful, at the end of the day, if you're talking about a vast amount of them infected who somehow find their way there, you're talking about just like a battle of attrition. And so as a result of that, uh, you end up having Green Lantern, Superman, and Wonder Woman who essentially lift the island up a little bit higher. And then you go to Gotham and you get one of the coolest moments in the whole story, right? Because what you end up learning is that over the course of a week, an entire jungle grew throughout the entire city of Gotham. And of course, that's when you end up learning that it's Poison Ivy that made that happen. Now, of course, Killer Croc tries to attack, you know, Batman and 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 uh, and Green Arrow and uh, Dinah Lance, the new the new Green Lantern, tries to attack him. He's taken out, you know, by, by Poison Ivy. But that's when we end up learning Poison Ivy used her power of the green to create a kind of safe haven in the entirety of Gotham. But the funny thing about this is the only people allowed in are the people she allows in. And at the moment, it only really seems to be Harley Quinn and, and Poison Ivy herself. And Harley, this is kind of a cool moment. Harley has actually been advocating to turning it into a refuge and saying, look, like you have all this stuff here, right? Like you've grown vines here and there's this great big huge thorn wall and like none of the undead can get in here. So like let innocent people in. And for the most part, Poison Ivy doesn't really seem to have wanted to do it. But then when you have Batman and everybody showing up and, and you have Damian Wayne basically saying, look, Bruce Wayne's dead, right? Like my father's dead. I'm the new Batman now. Poison Ivy begins to kind of feel for him because it's, it really is a kind of realization of how bad things are. And so as a result of that, knowing that Bruce Wayne is gone, knowing that Damian Wayne is taken up the mantle and realizing things are really just this dire, ultimately Poison Ivy gives in. And the response is, you know, of course, don't harm any of the trees or anything like that. And Damian Wayne answers like, we'll agree to any terms. And so what it does is it switches over to the Fortress of Solitude. Now the Fortress of Solitude itself is not really big enough to house all these innocent people. Otherwise I would have said like, why not turn that place into a refuge? It wasn't designed for that, right? It's just simply not that big, but it is big enough to become a new hall of justice, right? For what's left of the superhero community to essentially work together. And it's kind of a cool moment here because you have all these folks basically gathered around saying, here's where things stand. You've got Firestorm, Ronnie Raymond, you've got Power Girl. You've got a lot of these superheroes here who are basically doing the best they can to sort of keep everything under control to keep their heads level. You got Lex Luthor who's starting some nonsense, but one of the big things that's basically being worked on here is the creation of arcs. And the creation of arcs are a really cool idea because basically what it means is it allows humanity, or at least it seems to allow humanity, to basically sort of, of finding a way to escape. And it's kind of crazy because initially the response of Superman is, we're not leaving. We're not going to leave this planet. We're not going to abandon our home. And Lex Luthor sort of chimes in and just kind of like, you know, the human race is in, is in like a fight to survive, but it has to leave the planet. And it's kind of interesting because these are two opposing ideologies. For Lex Luthor, Earth is his home, right? But he's kind of like, in order for humanity to survive, we have to leave here. We have to go someplace else. But Superman lost his home, right? His home was destroyed before he was old enough to really do anything about it. And one of the big on-running themes about Superman is trying to find a way to maintain his home, trying to find a way to either reconnect with Krypton or protect Earth as best he can. And there's got to be a little bit of guilt here. If Earth is destroyed, then it's like Superman failed, right? And the idea of him failing and losing another home is really too much for him to deal with. And so it's kind of like, we can't simply just leave here. But in the end, you end up having like the mom of Superman, you know, coming in, Martha basically coming in and saying, hey, look, it's the only real choice that we have. They're able to kind of talk him down a little bit. Now, of course, Lex Luthor basically chimes in, you know, like, man, losing two worlds in a lifetime, it sucks to be you. Lois Lane punches the heck out of him. It's hilarious, man. She puts a haymaker on him. <laughs> And then she sees Jonathan when he when, when she realizes that he saw what, what she did. And he's like, ah, uh, violence is never the answer, Jonathan. And that, that's true. Violence is never the answer. That is a very true, that is a very true statement. However, violence is a answer, and it's a very effective answer, right? Like violence gets things done. And so it's it's <laughs> it's kind of crazy because with these arcs basically being built as a means to get humanity off the off the face of the planet, and with these various refuges serving as a place for humanity to reside until that time, it really starts to give people hope. It gives people the ability. And, and really the belief that there's other places they can go to, right? Communing, uh, communing with a Green Lantern ring, saying like, where are other places we can go? But ultimately what they end up realizing is that none of them were ever in control. And the reason why is because while all this is going down, suddenly they're met with this kind of buzzing sound. And then it begins to get louder and louder and begins to drive them insane, only for us to find out that when Lex Luthor dies, this is the Martian Manhunter and the Martian Manhunter is infected. Now, this is a big deal. And the reason why is because if you go and you read the JLA stories by Grant Morrison, one of the things that DC shows and, and actually states in, in multiple instances is that the Martian Manhunter is the most powerful being on Earth. He has all the abilities of Superman, plus he can shapeshift and he can read minds, right? Now he is afraid of fire, you know, as, well, sometimes he is, sometimes he's not, and it's just a weakness, whatever the case is. But like fire is basically the, the best way to combat him. But having a, a, a somebody out there who can shapeshift into pretty much anything and then suddenly show up and attack the entirety of the superhero community almost guarantees destruction for all of them. However, they have Ronnie Raymond on their side. They have Firestorm, who of course uses his powers and totally incinerates 
Martian Manhunter. The problem with this is that when that happens, the Flash Barry Allen is attacked and he's infected. And this is probably the worst case situation because he immediately takes off running. And the reason why this is bad is because you're talking about the fastest man alive who can basically infect the world. And he does it in the blink of an eye. Almost no survivors are left. Basically, he just like runs around from place to place before they even realize there's anybody there. They're infected, you know, and, and it's, it's insane how fast it happens. And so Superman basically responds by saying, hey, look, I can't really catch up with him, but I can meet him on the other side. And this is one of the coolest things because what he does is basically fly out, you know, to the moon and then fly back as fast as he possibly can and basically crash directly into Barry Allen. And where Barry Allen's totally destroyed in the process, he's cut in half. The issue with this is that some of the bones end up ripping into Superman. So now he's infected. And it's one of the saddest moments ever because what this means is the world is doomed. There's no escape here. Humanity has rafts and humanity can try to escape, but Superman could er eradicate those things in the blink of an eye. A guy who could fly into space and hold his breath for a pretty lengthy amount of time. And then of course has all those powers based on the abilities of, of solar radiation is, is insanely cool. The only way to really get around this would be to like retrofit the various ships with like green kryptonite, but you would have to do it in such a way to where the area of effect of that green kryptonite is so far out that Superman can't even get remotely close. But you're talking about a guy with telescopic vision, so he could be far enough away that he could use his heat vision and then shoot them and then destroy them, right? So I mean, it's kind of nuts. Now, ultimately the goal of Superman seemingly, you know, seeming as an infected person would be to spread the infection, not necessarily just kill people. And so if Tom Taylor stays true to what he's been doing so far, then retrofitting the ships with green kryptonite is the only real hope they have. But at the moment, they don't really seem to have any because as they sort of look around, Superman starts meeting with everybody. He knows his fate, his fate is sealed and everybody else does too. Lois really says her goodbyes and, and she's like, you know, thank you for choosing me. And, it, and it's such, it's such an incredibly touching moment. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for making this place your home. Thank you for loving me. And it's kind of crushing because in turn, he speaks to John and says like, you're the one running the show now. You're the man of the house now. Like you have to make sure everybody stays safe. The fate of humanity rests on your shoulders. And it seems like it'd be a huge amount of pressure to bestow on a child and it is, but it's also the reality of the situation. That's really what's going on here is that it really all does come down to Jonathan. But that's why I love DC so much is because this is things just getting insanely dire. Things are getting really, really bad because what's basically happened here is that now that Martian Manhunter is gone, the most powerful superhuman in the world is infected. And that's literally what's said here is that with, with the infection of Superman, hope was gone along with the entirety of their world, that there's no real saving anybody anymore. Okay, so we are at the conclusion of Deceased. And here's the thing, Deceased is an amazing story. It's ridiculous how good it is. And to be honest, I wasn't even sure it was gonna be this great, right? I was kind of on the fence. I was like, eh this is going to end up turning out. But Tom Taylor does what Tom Taylor always does, which is come out in spectacular fashion, right? So in the last video, we basically ended with Superman being infected. And it was like, okay, so this is basically the end of everybody, right? Like nobody's going to make it out alive here because you're talking about the Man of Steel, like the most powerful superhero on earth after the Martian Manhunter and the Martian Manhunter was already destroyed. The, the crazy thing about this is, is it's almost, um, it's, it's incredible the way this is done because it kind of parallels Superman as we know him as a superhero in comparison to Superman in terms of what's actually going on, right? So it's like, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The amazing man who's gonna kill you all. <laughs> it's Superman. But it's, it's it's crazy because the way this narration is taught is like all hope was lost at 11.48 a.m. And it's kind of nuts because what we end up doing is jumping over to the Fortress of Solitude, right? Which is where basically the last of the superheroes are all essentially gathered together. It's cool to see Tom Taylor do this because what they end up doing is really Damian Wayne kind of pops up and says, Batman all always had a kind of backup plan, always had a plan to basically deal with superheroes. And it turns out it was for pretty much everybody except uh, Green Arrow. <laughs> and Green Arrow's kind of disappointed because he's like, Batman didn't have a plan for me. Like, he didn't really consider me dangerous. And it's like, no, Green Arrow, I'm sorry, man. Now, one of the things that I want to kind of point out here is that Damian Wayne, it's not really a huge thing, but Damian Wayne never refers to himself as Batman. Damian Wayne always says like, like he always refers to Batman as a wholly different person, right? Like Batman had plans. Like he's just kind of a stand in, right? That he's not really Batman. He's just temporarily taking his place. It's interesting there because it shows that one, Damian Wayne has not accepted the fact that his father's actually dead. And two, Damian Wayne does not see himself as being Batman in the same way that Bruce Wayne was. Insofar as he's not really as good of a Batman as Bruce was, which is kind of a true statement, but it's also a true, it's also 
a great little uh, kind of tribute to, to Bruce himself. And so in addition to that, we also end up learning that, of course, Damian Wayne has a piece of kryptonite on him because, you know, how else are you going to defeat Superman? And then also Diana is the one, like Wonder Woman's the one who's been kind of sitting down and saying, we have to find, like, I, I also have schemes and I have ideas on how to take down these various superheroes. And so what she ends up doing is taking this kryptonite and merging it with uh, essentially metal and then crafting a sword out of it, which is a genius idea because, you know, when it comes to Wonder Woman, here's the important thing to understand about Wonder Woman. I wouldn't go as far as to say that people sleep on her, that she's like a, like she's a, she's a character that where it's just kind of like, eh, nobody really appreciates how capable she is. But Wonder Woman fights to the end. That's the nature of her character. She fights threats head on. She doesn't really rest on her laurels and kind of wait to see how things unfold. And so at the same time, the idea here is, okay, if this is going to be the case, then basically we take the various guys and we fall back, right? Like we fall back as best we can. We're going to take one group. They're all going to head to Gotham. They're going to grab as many of the survivors as they possibly can. They can only grab like a small number of them, right? Like a very, very small number of them, comparatively speaking, uh, and then basically head out, right? So they end up going to Gotham and they grab as many of the survivors as they can. Uh, and then they go to, they go to end up going to Themyscira to try to grab as many of the survivors as they possibly can. The problem is that once this arc arrives at Themyscira, they don't arrive alone. And it's actually one of the coolest things that go on here. It's one of the coolest things that happens. There's this tempest, this massive storm that takes place outside of the island. And when everybody's kind of gathering around waiting to see what it is, ultimately it's the arrival of Aquaman who summoned the Kraken. And this is one of the coolest things in the whole story, right? Because it's like Aquaman should, like Aquaman, here's the thing about Aquaman. Up until Dan Abnett wrote the character as, as part of like DC Rebirth, I never, I was never really interested in him. I was kind of like, Aquaman is a guy who's there and he talks to fish. And Aquaman fans hate it when you say that, but it's true. But like when you read Dan Abnett's run on Aquaman, it's like one of the greatest Aquaman epics that I think of, that I've ever read, either in hindsight or, or having read more recently. But like seeing Aquaman show up here with like an entire army of Atlanteans that in turn is channeling the Kraken is a sight to behold. But the first question that I had here is how was he able to find Themyscira? Because Themyscira is an island that cannot be found except by those who already know where it is. But then like Tom Taylor answers this in a, in a like with a quickness. What he says is that under normal circumstances, no, Themyscira cannot be found. Instead, what ended up happening here is that when Themyscira was turned into an island, its boundaries were expanded in order to make way for all these refugees, it took it out of its safe zone and it just brought it into the main world, right? Into the main DC universe, which technically was always kind of the case. There's this kind of dimensional barrier that sort of, of permeates and exists around Themyscira that keeps people from finding it. That was removed when they essentially turned it into a haven for anybody to be able to access. And so because of that, it was easily found by Aquaman and all of his forces. And they just come rolling in here and tearing everything up. Green Arrow gets his due, which is kind of cool here because he shoots an arrow through the eye or through the head of, 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 uh, of Aquaman. And he's like, see, I'm dangerous. I shot an arrow half a mile through like raging winds and, and hit a guy in the head. <laughs> But basically, it's calling in everybody they can, right? So Cassie Sandsmark, Wonder Girl, is already here. Uh, you end up having, like, all these Amazons that end up charging directly into the fray against the Atlanteans. And then half a world away, you've got Wonder Woman, you've got the new Green Lantern, Dinah Lance, and you've got Cyborg who go charging in against Superman. And the cool thing about this is this is, like, a colossal fight in scale, right? Like, I mean, this is really a fight to save the world is really what this is. If Superman wins, the arcs will fall. If the Amazons lose, the arc in Atlantis will fall. There's massive casualties on each side. Side. And the struggling thing about this for the Amazons, right? The, the biggest struggle about this is you're talking about a sisterhood. These are women who have fought together for, for eons, right? Who have fought together as friends or lived together as friends for eons and eons and eons, right? Imagine that you had a friend that you'd known for like a thousand years. And then imagine like that, you had to kill them, right? They, they turned against you in seemingly the blink of an eye. And that's what's going on here is like, these are our allies that have fought together forever. And then suddenly they turn into enemies when they're bitten and they're converted into these, you know, undead anti-life zombies. And so it's kind of crazy because what ends up happening here is basically once all these refugees are onto the Ark, then it's like, we have to go. We've got to bail. We can't stay here if we do. This Ark's going to be destroyed. And so the order comes down from Hippolyta, the leader of the Amazons, who says, flee, get out of here, leave us here. Like those of us who are not on the Ark, leave us here. We'll fight it. We'll hold off as best we can. But essentially they're sacrificing their life. It's a suicide mission. You're talking about what, what, what amounts to at this point, maybe three, four, possibly five Amazons holding off an army of, of Atlanteans. It's not going to happen, right? And so ultimately we're kind of left with the idea that like, all these different uh, these different Amazons basically end up falling and the arc makes it to safety. Following that, and this is kind of a cool moment, following that, you kind of switch back to Superman. And the, and here's the thing about Dinah Lance as, as the Green Lantern. She's capable, but the issue with her as a Green Lantern is she doesn't really have the experience that the other Green Lanterns do. She's literally flying by the seat of her pants. So creating like a giant horn and then doing her, her canary cry into the horn and then just like blowing it into Superman, that's cool. But in order to be an effective Green Lantern, what you need is finesse. You need the ability to understand 
understand how to bob and weave, how to dodge various targets. Now, at the same time, you are also talking about a super fast guy who's astronomically strong. So it's not an easy feat. It's not an easy thing. But the issue with this is that Superman almost gets the upper hand on Black Canary and almost kills her until his arm is cut off by Wonder Woman. The problem with this is that while Wonder Woman does get the upper hand on Superman for a moment, without hesitation, he takes out Wonder Woman. And that's what made Superman so dangerous as this, this zombie monster thing is because in doing that, Superman is, he's not hesitating here. Like he wants to kill the imperative drive that he has to kill and destroy as much as he possibly can. And so there's, there's, it's not like, oh my God, I'm getting ready to kill Wonder Woman. It's not like that. It's die, bam. And then just like punches a hole in her. And that's basically the end of that. It's, it's a crazy thing to kind of see because with Wonder Woman basically out of the picture now, immediately Superman takes off and starts going after the arcs. And this is when you get to what's probably the greatest point in the story, right? Like the greatest moment in the story. It's quick because basically like the arcs have made it off of earth, right? They're out there by the moon. They're on their, they're, they're essentially on their way out. God, Tom Taylor is so amazing at this. This is why I want to see, I want to see DC continue, which, you know, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, we'll talk about that once we get to the end, but like they get outside of earth, they're over there by the moon. They're basically taking off and you've got Jonathan and you've got Damien standing on one of the arcs and Jonathan's like, my father's coming. And Damien's like, yeah, your, your dad's on his way. It's not some grandiose gesture. It's nothing like that. It's just like, tell my mom, I love her and look after her. And then like, he basically tells Lois, like, I know what I'm doing. Everything's going to be okay. I promise I know what I'm doing. And then he just leaves the ship and goes to confront his dad. The issue with this is it's like a moment, right? Like, like Superman's charging towards the arcs. Like Jonathan Kent goes charging towards Superman and in a moment is able to basically knock him unconscious. And that's basically it. That, that's all that we get. But this is why this moment is so cool. And this is why this moment matters so much is because this is Jonathan Kent, right? This is what we would expect from the son of Superman. We would expect the son of Superman to understand that what's important here is the valuation of life, that this man is not his father. This man used to be his father, but it's not his father now. And his task, the last thing his father assigned him was to ensure the safety of everyone. And that's the choice Jonathan has to make is racing in and fighting his dad, which is a crushing situation, right? Like if he killed Superman, it'd be patricide. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool thing to see because it's like, this is what he has to do. At the same time, like for the most part, it's a stopgap measure is really what it, what it appears to be. Because at the end of the day, despite how capable Jonathan is, he's not on the same level as his father. And so once Superman comes to, then presumably the fight would continue, but Jonathan likely wouldn't be able to end it. But none of that matters because while, while Dinah Lance is sitting out, dude, this is why I love Tom Taylor. While Dinah Lance is sitting out there, right? She suddenly hears, attention Green Lantern of Sector 2814. The cavalry has arrived and the entire Green Lantern Corps comes racing in with Ganthet and the Guardians of the Universe. And it's like, dude, <laughs> I had no idea this was gonna happen. Dude, it's the coolest thing. It's like one of the greatest things ever because like, okay, so like they're basically all safe because there's no way Superman could overcome every single one of these Green Lanterns. And that's really kind of how it goes, right? Plus they have Ganthet, who would be more than enough to destroy Superman just in his current form. And so what ends up happening is there's this kind of standoff for a second, right? Superman just kind of stands there, just sort of looks, you know, and tries to figure out how it is that he can destroy these guys. And, and like Ganthet initially holds off and Superman goes racing into the sun. And it's like, what in the hell is he doing? It's like, he's feeding, he's absorbing the energy of the sun. And basically that's when everything kind of gets cut off. And that's when they're like, we have to leave. And the reason why is because if Superman drains out all that solar energy, then one, he's probably going to be God tier powerful, right? Like Superman 1 million powerful. But at the same time, it's going to kill all life on earth because while the earth, while the earth does have heat inside of it by virtue of like the ozone layer, that heat won't last forever. It's, it's like having a warm house and then cutting off your heat. Eventually that heat is going to dissipate through the windows. And ultimately your house, if you give it long enough, is going to become as cold as the outside or pretty close to it. And so as a result of that, the earth is basically doomed. And that's basically what they say is like the green lanterns, the guardians of the universe are quarantining earth. They're basically cutting earth off. And so like everybody's essentially got to go. Like there's, there's, there's no saving the planet anymore because there's no way to sustain life on the planet anymore. So all those humans who were left behind are all guaranteed to die. There's no rescuing them. There's no getting them out. And so it, it kind of sucks here because what you end up doing is jumping back to earth itself and where cyborg has managed to use the lasso of truth around wonder woman. This is actually genius by Tom Taylor. Like he comes to this realization, the lasso of truth compels you to speak the truth, right? So he asks wonder woman, do you have a voice? Can you speak? And she, refers, she simply says, yes, we have a voice, right? So what this indicates is that these zombies, these anti-life monsters, more or less have a hive mind. And so following that, the question becomes, is there a cure? Is there a way to end this virus? Because that's basically what it is. Like you're simply just a viral infection. Is there a way to end it? And the response is yes, there is a way to end it. And so when Cyborg asks like, what's the way to cure this? The response is that the cure is in you. Like you're the only way to cure this thing. You're the cause of all this, right? Like you're man, 
man and machine. You are the, the way by which the vector by which this was spread, that it was a, it was a mathematical equation that spread from your machine components into your human element and then spread throughout the rest of the world. The problem with this is that where Cyborg begins to panic and realizes, hey, I need to tell somebody what's going on. I need to go tell the people on the arcs. Wonder Woman rips his head off. <laughs> so no one knows that there's a cure for this thing. No one knows that there's a cure for this, for this infection. And so ultimately what you end up having is, is the guardians of the universe who guide the earthlings back to their new home, which they dub Earth 2, which is a cool little nod to the Earth 2 continuity. And basically the story ends. But here's what I want to know is like, if Superman was absorbing all that energy from the sun, what happens to Superman, right? Like what goes on with that? That's why stories like this are cool is because it's kind of left open-ended a possibility for a sequel to emerge or at the very least just kind of letting us as the as the as the reader sort of answer that question on our own kind of descend into debates and different things like that but with that being said guys we're going to bring this video to an end if you are new here to comments explain make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and i will catch you all later peace